I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you are a 38-year-old man from Syria who has watched your country dissolve into horror and war around you. You escaped just over a year ago into Turkey where you've actually been providing services to other refugees while you go through the extensive vetting process to seek asylum in the United States. Your wife is actually already living in Long Beach, California because she got asylum last year. And she's there with your two-year-old son, who's a United States citizen and whom you've met only once. You finally get the news that you're approved and you book your flight from Istanbul to Los Angeles for January 29th, 2017. Now, unbeknownst to you, just two days prior, the new president of the United States has signed an executive order that put into place the first Muslim travel ban. So by the time you arrive at the Istanbul airport, you are swept up in the worldwide chaos that has ensued. And nothing is clear except that no airline will allow you to board a flight to the United States. I became connected to this young man and his story just about a year ago today, in the days just after the Muslim travel ban. I was part of an international group of attorneys and advocates and elected officials, connected only by email, but fighting to reunite him with his family. You see, something kind of amazing happened with lawyers last January. Like maybe you saw some of the news footage of lawyers of all people camped out at airports working overnight on laptops. They flooded by the thousands into airports around the world to provide legal help to passengers and families impacted by the travel ban. Lawyers became first responders. And for this brief moment in time, centuries of lawyer jokes were set aside. <laughs> well, I had the amazing privilege of being one of these lawyers helping to coordinate the legal clinics that popped up overnight at the Los Angeles and San Francisco International Terminals. You see, I became a lawyer specifically to fight for the rights of people like this young man and his family. And I share his story with you today because it is one example among many of the promise of the American civil justice system. And also because I'm here to tell you that in this moment in time in our country's history, that system needs your generation to be aware, to be informed, and to be active watchdogs to protect it. Now I need you to set aside for a moment everything that you know about the criminal justice system. Because we're going to talk about the other side, about civil justice. And the best way that I can think about civil justice is it's this beautiful promise that we actually make to each other about how we'll handle things when we disagree. So if I rent from a landlord who refuses to fix the broken toilet in my apartment and it's spewing raw sewage back into my bathroom, well, we don't handle that disagreement by resorting to our own means, me wrecking the apartment out of anger or him showing up with a baseball bat to violently throw me out or to intimidate me into silence. Instead, in this country, we agree to hand that whole disagreement over to an outside third-party decision-maker, a judge and a court, who will listen to our stories and then weigh the facts and the law and then hand us a decision. And we also agree, winner or loser, that when that that this decision is handed over, we will both follow it. You see, this is a great equalizer in our country a system that can adjust for the inherent imbalance in power and privilege in our society. It's one of the core pillars of American democracy. It's an enforcement mechanism for the promise that we make for liberty and justice for all. But for that promise to ring true, for the civil justice system to work, it requires two things. It requires something called the rule of law, and it requires all of us as ordinary citizens to hold it accountable. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the news recently about the rule of law, which is just this, some ideas from our Constitution. First, that we will be a nation of laws. That means that we're governed by laws and we're not governed by the whims or the proclamations of a king or of a dictator. The second is that each and every one of us, regardless of our race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, social economic status, really any group or individual characteristic, we shall all be equal 
under the law. And the last idea is that the rule of law applies to all of us as individual people. It also applies to corporations. And most importantly of all, and this is not true everywhere in the world, it applies to the government, including the president. So this means the civil justice system is totally the place that can decide my disagreement with my landlord over that broken toilet. It also means, though, that if a company produces something that harms you or me or a group of people, we can all take that harm into the civil justice system, and that system can decide whether the corporation did something wrong and what should happen if it did. And if the president of the United States does something that harms a group of people, that system may decide whether the president did something wrong and what should happen if he did. As you see, that system sits squarely on the rule of law, and that's the power in the system. But the system is also fragile. It's fragile because also at its heart, it's just this ephemeral promise that we make to each other, that the government in turn makes to all of us. You see, when the system is working, it's just like oxygen. We need it to survive, but it's invisible all around us. But if we take that system for granted, if we stop being the active watchdogs to protect it, well, it can weaken and completely erode. But so what does it even mean to be an active watchdog for a civil justice system? I mean, like, what can we do? Well, the first is we have to be aware. You have to know the system exists. You have to make the oxygen visible. And the second is to be informed. You have to know how the system works and what the risks are to it and what protections exist. Let, let, let me talk about it like this. When I was a kid, I did not appreciate my parents' rules, especially when I was caught breaking them. And when I got in trouble, oh, I would argue with my parents. I would tell them that their rules were not fair. I would tell them that they did not apply their rules equally between me and my sisters. And I never won a single one of these arguments. I inevitably just ended up in more trouble and being sent downstairs to my room. And every time when I got to the bottom of those stairs, I would stop, trembling with this righteous indignation, and I would always yell the same phrase back up the stairs to my parents. What about kids' rights? What about kids' rights? I don't even know what I thought I meant by that phrase. I just, I wanted to be heard, right? I wanted to protest. I wanted justice. And now apologies to my parents, but their rules were arbitrary, right? They were allowed to be, right? You guys know parents are the dictators and the kings in a family system. They are allowed to make the rules up as they go along. My parents did not have to be fair to me. They did not have to give me a hearing to air my grievances. But that feeling, that feeling of righteous indignation, that was real. And can you imagine for a moment what it would be like if our civil justice system operated the way my parents' rules did? I mean, what if the, the rules, the laws, were not written down and posted online where we could all read them and understand them, but they were kept in some back room, and they were only available to the people who already had power? Or what if the decision makers, the judges, were not fair, but heavily influenced by local politics and their relationships or even bribes? What if ordinary people like you and me we're never allowed into the rooms where our voices might be heard. That is actually how courts in some countries work. So what, what keeps that from happening here? Well, we have the Constitution. And we have 200 years of history of the system being in place. But I think the most basic fundamental protection for our civil justice system is you and me. You see, generations of Americans have fought to protect our civil justice system, some in times of greater challenge than others. And I am telling you that in this moment in time in our country's history, it needs you more than ever to be aware, to be informed, to be an active watchdog. And that means holding the system accountable to be accessible, not only to you, not only to me, but who anyone who needs it. Because if our system is the great equalizer under law, then it is deeply wounded if there are people who cannot access it. Let's think about it this way. When I was a kid in elementary school, I loved the parachute game. And my favorite moment was when we'd all stretch the fabric way up over our heads, right? And then we would turn around inside and whip it down as fast as we could and make that mushroom balloon tent thing with all of us tucked inside. 
for me, our civil justice system is that parachute moment. You know, Martin Luther King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But I don't think it bends towards justice on its own. I think it takes all of us stretching up and grabbing on, and we work together to bend the arc by pulling. And just like the parachute, it takes all of us. And that's what I'm trying to do as a lawyer, to grab a hold of my piece of the parachute and bend that arc. And I do this in a portion of the civil justice system called legal aid or legal services. We're a network of nonprofits, and our whole mission is to make sure that ordinary people, and especially people who are low income, get full access to that civil justice system. Now, there are 5 million low income Californians who will experience at least one pressing legal problem each year that relates to a basic life necessity. But let me tell you, only lawyers think about these things as legal problems. For the people experiencing them, they are just life problems. I complained to my landlord about the toilet, and instead of fixing it, he serves me with eviction papers. Or a young woman who has just left an abusive relationship, and she is terrified by the idea that her abuser can find her at her job. Or the Vietnam veteran who's living on the streets because he's been denied the housing benefits and the medical care that he needs. All of those people are experiencing life problems that just happen to have legal solutions. And far too many Californians cannot afford to hire an attorney to get the legal help they need. And unlike the criminal justice system, we are not entitled to a lawyer to be appointed for us in the civil justice system, even when our most basic needs are at issue. So these people are shut out of the civil justice system. They are far outside the parachute because they cannot afford it. And so legal aid nonprofits, legal aid lawyers, provide them with that legal help for free. Legal aid lawyers are first responders every day. They show up when people have a legal crisis, whether it's standing in the courtroom with that survivor of domestic violence, or even in the crisis centers after the recent wildfires. And last January, legal aid lawyers were at the heart of the legal clinics in the SF and LA airports. So it was no accident that last February 3rd, I was sitting in the SFO clinic, emailing still with that Syrian father who was still stuck in Istanbul. There was a moment where Boston was the only airport allowed to passengers, and he was actually standing in line to board the last flight out of Istanbul to Boston, when he suddenly emailed our group that the airline personnel had come over and they were trying to pull him out of line because they thought the window of timing was too tight. Our group erupted into activity. It was this heart-stopping moment and suddenly my phone started buzzing with a news alert because this remarkably American thing had just happened. A civil court issued a national order that prevented the travel ban from putting, being put into place. A civil justice court had listened to the stories, weighed the facts and the law, and handed over a decision that the government, the president, had to obey. So we immediately got all of the information about this decision to that young father, and he was able to convince the airline to allow him to board. And with his permission, I'd like to share with you the words that he sent to all of us as he was boarding that flight. Dear all, no matter how much I talk, it will not be enough to celebrate your efforts. It is a dream that I finally get to see my wife and my son. This was a hard experience, and I am sure that your efforts will win in the end, breaking all fake walls between human hearts. And so this, this is what the rule of law exists to do, what civil justice strives to do, what legal aid has the power to do to break down all the walls that exist between our most human hearts. But it takes all of us to be champions of this civil justice system. Now is not the time to stand at the bottom of the stairs. Now is the time to grab the parachute, be aware, be informed. Demand that the civil justice system in this country work for you and for me and for all of us regardless of who we are, what we have, or where we come from. Thank you.